Okay, so to study networks, we want to first know what is a network. We also want to ask, why should we care? So the first question is, what is a network? A network is simply a system of elements that are connected. These elements are called nodes or vertices, and the connections are called links or edges. And network science is all about the connections because the connections make the system as what it is. We care about the structure of the connections as well as the dynamics on this structure. And it is also interesting how structure affect the dynamics and how dynamics affect the structure. For instance, if you look around, you make so many social connections, right? And you form all kinds of social groups and this gives you the network structure. And what's happening on this network is governed by this structure. For instance, your political view may be largely shaped by the friends, family, and people around you. But at the same time, the dynamics can affect the structure. For instance, you may unfriend someone on social media if that person keeps posting something that really, really hit your nerve, right? So in such case, what's going on on the network can shape the structure too. So why should we care about those networks? I think one of the most important reasons is that it is not enough to understand individual elements in many, many cases. For instance, look at the Lego blocks. Let's say you study each individual Lego block really, really closely. You study all properties of this Lego block. Okay, does it guarantee that you can make things like this? Understanding individual Lego blocks doesn't really help you to create this wonderful kinetic sculpture, right? It's all about how you put together the Lego blocks, not individual Lego blocks that matters. And let's look at this example. Here is a rice plant. Do you know how many genes do they have? It turns out that they have about 40,000 to 50,000 genes. How about humans? Well, the current estimate is about 20,000 genes. So rice has way more genes than human, right? Does it mean that rice is more complex than human? Of course not. Again, it's not about the number of genes. It's not about individual genes. It's how they interact and how they form these complex networks in our cells. Here's another example. Let's say you study one neuron really closely. And you know everything about how an individual neuron behaves. But does that mean we can understand the whole brain? I don't think so. To understand how our brain works, we really need to understand how they are connected, how they interact, and what kind of dynamics they generate, right? And if you think about the artificial neural networks, it's not about individual neurons. It's all about figuring out the right connections. So as you can see in these examples, it is not enough to understand individual elements. And that means we really need to understand the connections. What's the structure of the connections? What kind of dynamics do they generate? These are really critical questions to understand the whole system. The second reason is that networks are everywhere. If you look at any living organisms, you can see that they consist of these individual cells, right? And if you look into the cells, you'll see these complex interactions between molecules. So inside our cell, there are DNAs, proteins, RNAs, and all kinds of other molecules, and they interact in a really intricate way. And essentially, that interaction is life. For instance, our cell function as a factory in a way. This is a depiction of so-called the metabolic network, and it describes how our cells break down complex molecules. This is the reason why you can eat pretty much whatever you want, because your body can break it down. And while breaking down all this food, your body also generates energy, 
And then after that, you can put together these simple molecules into proteins, DNA, and all kinds of building blocks of your body. And your body has more networks. For instance, all the genes regulate each other, turning on and off other genes. And the proteins produced from those genes interact with each other. They form protein complexes that does all kinds of jobs in your body. And your cell has all kinds of signaling network where you sense what's going on outside your cell. And all these network work together to make you alive. And if you look at your brain, it is a giant network of neurons. And neurons send signals to each other. And that's how you think, essentially. And of course, you are embedded in your social network. Okay, this is called Stellar Navigation Network, and it essentially captures how far can we travel. So all the nodes are stars here, and you connect to stars if they are close enough. So let's say we can travel like five light years. Then we connect every pair of stars that are closer than five light years. And once you connect to all these stars, then this network captures all the stars that we can travel starting from one star. And you can also generalize this notion to the galaxies. And here is something called cosmic web. And this is the same idea. You connect galaxies to each other if they are close enough. Then you can see this mega structure among the galaxies. And here is another fun example. This is something called the Wood Wide Web. And this is a network formed by fungi that connect trees in a forest. Trees and fungi form these symbiotic relationships. And trees can use this fungal network to send signals to other trees. I think this is a just fascinating network. And if you look at our food, we can also find the network. So this was my paper. And here we connected the culinary ingredients to each other if they share a lot of flavor compounds. And you can see all kinds of interesting clusters of food, like meat, all kinds of fruits, trees, seafood. And you can use this network to study what we eat and what we like. Again, networks are everywhere. And the third point I want to make is that networks let us make really fun analogies. Yeah, this is one of my favorite quotes by Stepan Banach, a mathematician. He said, good mathematicians see analogies, and great mathematicians see analogies between analogies. Like, it really emphasizes the role of analogies in math, but I think analogies are really cool in other scientific fields too. Let's rewind to 19th century for a bit. 19th century was when the Industrial Revolution was happening, Charles Darwin was living, Beethoven was making music, and Lincoln was living. So this is around the time. And 19th century was when science became really established. One of the really cool ideas that happened in 19th century was atomic theory. And here is the book called A New System of Chemical Philosophy by John Dalton. And this book was the landmark for atomic theory, which is this awesome idea that every matter is a system made of many individual elements called atoms. But interestingly, similar idea pops up in other fields too. For instance, there was a cell theory in 19th century by these two guys. And it argues that every living organism is again a system made of many individual elements called cells. We also got the neuron doctrine by Lamon y Cajal. And the idea is re really similar, that every brain is a system made of many individual elements called neurons. And another similar development was in statistics. There was a lot of development in measuring these social numbers. And essentially the key idea is that every society is again a system made of many individual elements called people. In 19th century, across many fields, there was this idea that everything is a system with many individual elements. And that allowed many, many interesting analogies. So for instance, there is something called law of large numbers. And this was beautifully captured by Bertassium video about the Cointos bat. 
I want you to consider this bet. Here's $10. This could be yours. If I flip this coin in the air, you guys call it in the air. If you're right, I give you the $10. If you're wrong, you give me $10. <laughs> I saw that coming. <laughs> what about 20? That's as high as I'm going today. $20, that is the top. It's two to one. I just don't like taking that much risk. You don't like risking 10 bucks. So although the expected value is positive, people tend to avoid the bet if the coin toss is just only once. Because you may lose the money. But by changing it to if we played enough and I many, had many coin tosses, you know, a stake of ten dollars, then eventually, yes, I would make more money. Yes. Why does repeating the same bet change it? I don't think there's a rational thought behind it. It's just a a feeling that one gets when presented with the opportunity. Hmm. I don't know. I think there is a rational reason behind it. Is it? Yeah. You can make sure that you almost always win. Because as you have more and more coin tosses, what you get will be really similar to the expected value. And that's the law of large numbers. Although this has been discovered many times throughout the history, uh, one of the key person attributed to was Poisson of the Poisson distribution. And he didn't get the idea of this law by working on his desk. He was actually sitting in the trials and watching the convictions and acquittals. So by watching many, many trials, he noticed a pattern, which is that if you have so many trials, the number of acquittals and convictions converge into certain numbers. The same as the coin tosses. Although the chances of conviction and acquittal vary one trial to another, if you observe many, many trials, they tend to converge. And the point is, he got this idea by looking at social processes, not the mathematical or physical processes. A really similar thing happened for the discovery of the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. Both Maxwell and Boltzmann knew all this work going on in social censuses and social statistics. And they used the analogy between particles and people. In social statistics, people knew that we don't need to study every individual. If you know the statistical properties, we can get the social census because it's all about the statistics and probabilities. And the same idea went into the physics and that led to the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. This idea that everything is a system with many, many individual elements, that led to probabilistic and statistical thinking in 19th centuries. What I want to argue here is that we are now able to measure interactions across all kinds of systems, like biological systems, ecological systems, or social systems, and so on. And that can lead us to the idea that not only everything is a system with many individual elements, but everything is a system with many individual elements that are connected and interact. And that's the core of the network thinking. Because networks are everywhere, and because once we find the network, we can get this nice abstraction, and that means we can make all kinds of interesting analogies between totally different systems. And I want to show my example. So I have been studying the spreading processes, especially in like social systems. For instance, in this study on Twitter, we looked at how hashtags spread on Twitter and which hashtag become viral later. And based on the theory of social contagion, we came up with some measures and prediction model to predict uh, a viral hashtags. But then these guys noticed that this model can be applied to brain. And that led to this paper on neuron that applies our social contagion model to the brain connectome data. And that was totally unexpected analogies between social system and brain. And after that, I have been working on the idea that this social contagion also governs the information processing of the brain. And that means we may expect the brain to be organized as certain modularity. So it was really fun to go back and forth between social systems to brain 
And I think this is a really nice example where network science let us make wild analogies. So throughout the semester, I want you to think about these three points. Can you find networks that nobody has been looked at? Or think about what are the networks around you that I didn't mention here. And when you discover a network, think about what are the connections and why do they matter? Can you understand that system without thinking about the connections? Or are the connections really, really critical to understand that system? And finally, think about analogies. So if you have uh, totally different networks, what kind of analogies can you make? Can your analogy help us to understand one system using the knowledge from the other system? So you may be able to find really wild analogies that can help us to solve some really challenging scientific problems. So that's it for today. Thank you for watching and welcome to Net Talk Thinking.